From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. It's not even January yet, and it already feels like campaign season is in full swing. Two Republicans have thrown their hats into the ring to try and unseat incumbent Democratic Governor Gina Raimondo, and another former GOP lawmaker may dive in, too, while Lincoln Chafee is still actively considering his own comeback bid. On the federal side, U.S. Senator Sheldon Whitehouse will have to wait and see which of the two Republican candidates, former State Justice Robert Flanders or State Rep Bobby Nardolillo, he'll face in November. Plus, it's been one year since Donald Trump was elected president, breaking down a busy 2017 and looking ahead to what's stacking up to be an even busier 2018 with a political roundtable this week on Newsmakers. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. Joining me on this roundtable from WPRI.com, we have reporter Ted Nisi and Lisa Pelosi. She was the former communications director to Governor Lincoln Almond. And then we welcome back Eyewitness News political analyst Joe Fleming. Good to have you, Joe. Great. And Kara Cromwell from the appropriately named Cromwell <laughs> Public Affairs. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. To quote Jake and Elwood, uh, Elwood Blues, we're getting the band back together. <laughs> Good to see you. That's a blues I think brother. you've used it's that a, one before. Before. I have not used that, have I? You probably have. We've haven't. been together too long. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start with the governor's race. So as I said at the top, uh, you know, there's already two that have thrown their hat to the ring, Alan Fung, Patricia Morgan. We could potentially have, what, four Republican candidates here. Uh, former state rep Joe Trillo is also uh, considering a run, and there's been whispers of Giovanni uh, Ferrochi. He might enter the race. We don't know yet. We'll get to Lincoln Chafee in a moment. But there are so many people that... Uh, want to possibly uh, take on Governor Gina Raimondo and defeat her, do they smell blood in the water, Joe? Oh, I think so, definitely. I think Gina's biggest problem is, is the fact that the governor has got elected with 41 percent of the vote, and a job approval rating really has not moved much since she's become the governor in the last three years. Polling that I've seen shows her in the mid to low 40s in most cases, so I think it's part of the problem. I think Republicans smell blood in the water. They believe that there's a good opportunity to take down a sitting governor in the state of Rhode Island. And Ted, what does it say that uh, Governor Raimondo hired uh, Connecticut Governor Dan Malloy's campaign manager? I found this one of the most telling things, and, and credit to our friend Ian Donis, who had that scoop over at Rhode Island Public Radio. Um, Dan Malloy, Connecticut's governor, he's not running again, but in 2014, he won an absolute slog of a re-election race by all accounts out of Connecticut. Uh, he won, I just checked the polling, he had, Governor Malloy had a 38% approval rating when he won one re-election. Um, and what that tells you is it was one of those campaigns where both candidates get dragged down, very negative, uh, you know, and you decide, well, the, the devil I know is better than the devil I don't know, and, and people in Connecticut went with Malloy. That suggests to me the governor thinks this is not going to be a Charlie Baker, you know, floating on air type of re-election race next year. It's going to be a knockdown, drag out fight, and she needs someone who knows how to, how to win that kind of battle. All right, Lisa, assuming the governor is either not primaried or if she is, she wins, uh, uh, and looking ahead to the general election, if you're uh, uh, an opponent to Governor Gina Raimondo, what are you poking at for the general election? Well, you start off with, are you better off, that old chestnut, are you better off today than you were four years ago? And when you look at um, what she ran on, she ran on her management style, that she was a very competent uh, treasurer, and she would come in and run state government in that way. And what have we seen since that? We've seen a mismanagement of the Department of Human Services with the ongoing uh, UHIP um, problem. We've seen the ongoing uh, Department of Children, Youth, and Families, which has always been a tough uh, agency for any governor, but she's not doing any better with the mismanagement. And we're talking about people in both of these cases. There are people being harmed. There are young children being harmed for UHIP. There are older people in nursing homes who are being harmed. We look at her management of the budget. As you reported, this is the first time for um, a current state budget to be in deficit since 2014. So we're going in, but this year we're in deficit spending. Next year, we have an extraordinary amount of deficit already that we know we have to fill, never mind if we're paying for something like the car tax. Are we doing free tuition? So she... Can't so fit all this into <laughs> 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> so, for, for, you know, it's mismanagement across the board. And as far as the jobs, you know, she's had a number of companies that she's been able to say that she's bringing jobs in, but we've had a number of companies uh, leaving or shutting down, too. So... So what are you touting, Kara, as, as the governor? I mean, I, I, governing is hard. I think there's no doubt out about that. Uh, when I worked for Bruce Sunland, DCYF was an issue back then. Um, I think it's, the, you know, prisons. It's not easy. It's not easy to run a state. Um, I do think it's jobs in the economy. That question of are you better off today than you were four years ago, I think most Rhode Islanders would actually say yes. 
18,000 new jobs since she started. And look at the things that we're talking about now. We're talking about companies moving in, Virgin Pulse relocating their headquarters to uh, Providence from Framingham. All of the new direct destinations you can get to from TF Green Airport. I'm going to Martinique. I don't know about you guys, <laughs> <laughs> but I can get that. But a, that's a losing direct... our skilled workforce to another <laughs> another place. <laughs> I think temporarily. Just for a week. Oh, okay. I'll be back. Right. Yeah, I'll be back. But I mean, you can do things now in Rhode Island that you couldn't do before. People are super excited about the state, and I think she can tout that. And Joe, you know, in the last yep. time Governor Raimondo was uh, on the ballot. It was a three-way yes, race with the late Bob Healy as an independent. Yeah. This appears, unless something dramatic changes, this could be a two-way well, race. Tim, that's going to be one of the key things here. If the governor has a two-way race, I think she has more of a problem getting reelected than in a three-way race. And again, depending on who the third candidate is. I mean, Bob Healy drew votes of people that would not vote for Gina Raimondo for governor, but they didn't want to vote for the Republicans. So he picked up a lot of the votes. A lot of those were union votes, teachers who were still upset about the pension system, and that hasn't changed in this past three years. So those people are going to be looking somewhere to go. The question is, will the Republican candidate become more moderate? If the Republican candidate stays too conservative, those people may end up having to vote for Gina, because the governor, because they can't vote for the Republican. But if the Republican stays moderate, and I think that was a mistake Alan Fung made four years ago, when you asked the very simple question about right to work, and he said he was supportive, I think he lost a lot of union support then. If he stayed more moderate and said, you know, that's something that wouldn't happen in Rhode Island, he might have had a lot of those votes. So a lot of it's going to be on how the Republicans position themselves after the Republican primary and who gets through the Republican primary. What do you think Alan Fung, let's talk about the primary now, Ted, what do you think Alan Fung has learned uh, from uh, the last time he ran for governor? As Joe points out, he sort of tacked to the right when he was going against Ken Block and then had to come back to the left for the uh, the general election. Does he just try and slow and steady, keep it as well, it stays a moderate? Well, you know, it's, it's so early in some ways, um, for, but I can already see the outlines of how the primary strategy Strategies are developing. You've got Alan Fung uh, is very much seems to be taking this approach of uh, almost what we call a rose garden strategy. You know, keep your distance. So he refused to take reporter questions at his kickoff, which is unusual in Rhode Island. Now, this morning's Providence Journal, he won't answer Kathy Gregg's question about whether he supports or opposes the tax reform. Hard bill. to do in a debate, though. You're going to have to eventually answer the questions. He can't do it forever, questions. but I think clearly his campaign thinks. Look, they just put out a poll that showed him as the front runner in the race, so they clearly feel confident that he, you know, he's in a position uh, to. It's his to lose, basically. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to avoid mistakes. Patricia Morgan, as you'd expect from an underdog, just the opposite. She's very available. She uh, is always going on the record. She's she's proactively putting out news releases. Just last night, she showed up at the uh, environmental assessment hearing about truck tolls, which has been a big issue on the right. Uh, a lot of people unhappy about the truck tolls. So Patricia Morgan, much more knowing she has to get out there and really make a name for herself. Then Joe Trillo had a letter out this week, um, casting himself very much as Trump's man in Rhode Island, saying we need to make Rhode Island great again. Uh, you know, starting to give a sense of what he's going to be. So you can see all three of them already finding their different paths. And we don't. what I don't think we know enough about yet is where the mood of the Republican primary electorate is and which of those strategies is the type. You know, you didn't have any candidate over 50 percent yet in that Fung poll. I also think in the Fung poll, if you notice, the Trump supporters are very strong for Alan Fung. However, Joe Trillo hasn't made his case that he really did all the Trump work. Keep in mind, in the 2014 governor's Republican primary, 32,000 people voted. In 2016, in the Republican presidential primary, 61,000 voted, and Donald Trump at 39,000. If Joe Trillo takes those 39,000 and just keep massaging those, his numbers should be able to go up because he's such a strong Trump supporter. There's going to be a money issue here, too. I mean, the three of them are going to have to raise some money to get their message out. There's no, and it's. Uh, Alan Fung could also tap into public funds again. He Not could. for the primary. Not, Not for the primary, right. true, for the general. For the general. Yeah. Um, and none of them really have enough money at this point to get their message out effectively. And then you get to the general election and you're facing a, a governor who potentially didn't have a primary who should be sitting on four and a half million dollars by then. Well, she may have a primary, Spencer Dickinson, so there would be a primary for the governor. But or Lincoln Chafee. Or Lincoln Chafee. Or Lincoln Chafee. But um, Trillo and Morgan, they both have to get known, and that does take money. But keep in mind, let's go back, as Lisa might remember, 1994, when we had a Republican primary. Sitting Congressman Ron Makeley running against a former U.S. Attorney and Town Administrator, Lincoln Ahman. Ahman, if I remember correctly, did no TV at all and won that primary by about 12,000 votes. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it can be done, but it takes a lot of grassroots work. And when I saw Patty Morgan at 25%, that says to me she does have a base of support to start with. Mm -hmm. Whether that's anti-Trump, I'm sorry, anti-Fung vote, 
or is a vote for her? We don't know at this time. I'll just throw this question out there. Um, you know, you brought up Lincoln Chafee could could run um, against Governor Raimondo. Uh, he told you he'd run as a Democrat because you're never sure. Still are calling Stephanie Shadow actually. Yeah. Okay, Republican turned independent now. Democrat Goldilocks. What do you make? What do you make of Lincoln Chafee? Well, I was intrigued uh, yesterday. Uh, a little bird told us that. Uh, Matt, House Speaker Nicholas Mattiello, who effectively controls the state Democratic Party apparatus and who has a frosty relationship a lot most of the time with Governor Raimondo, had lunch with Lincoln Chafee this week at the Old Canteen on Federal Hill, which is a place to see and be seen uh, on they Federal Hill. They commiserate Hill. about someone. Uh, yeah, and, uh, you know, both of them say, oh, it was a social occasion, it's the holidays, we wanted to get together. But, you know, everyone in politics is going to see that partly as a, a clear, you know, message from Mattiello to Governor Raimondo, which is, I'm happy to communicate with the enemy, uh, your enemy uh, tank there. And Lincoln Chafee told me he's still actively considering uh, jumping into the primary. He has the ben he has two things going for him. He certainly has some downsides we can talk about. But one is, he has a boatload of money because he's independently wealthy, his family is. And two, like Buddy Cianci in 2014, Link Chafee can jump into the race on the filing deadline in June and still have, you know, near universal name ID and stuff. Now, does that mean he wins? I'm not saying that, but it does mean he's instantly competitive, or at least he's instantly a contender if he jumps in. Then this just strikes me as somebody who's missing getting enough attention. I mean, the, uh, honestly, he had his shot. He could have run for re-election. He chose not to. He wanted to sail off into the sunset on his victory at the DMV. Sailing off into the sunset by running for president? president. Well, <laughs> and then there was that. But, you know, I mean, it seems like you had your shot, you had your time, and now you're just, you know, tossing your face back in because people haven't been paying attention to you. But also keep in mind, if he does decide to run, Spencer Dickerson is also a progressive, Lincoln Chavey is a progressive, and Gina, I'm sure, considers herself somewhat of a progressive also. So you have a lot of very liberal people running for the governor's primary. And you can't say Lincoln Chafee is going to pick up a lot of union support because he signed the pension bill. Mm -hmm. So people right there still have problems with him. I think in a three-way race, the governor is in a lot better position than just in a two-way race. Spencer Dickinson, we should say, the former uh, rep from South County, right. who uh, has already he actually put a sticker on the front page of the right. Providence Journal saying he's looking at a primary yeah. against Governor Mundo. All right, we're going to go to a break soon. Lisa, do you have any final thoughts on the government? We didn't even get to the U.S. Senate race, which we're going to have to push to the second <laughs> half now, which is par for the course for this group. Uh, we seem to obsess on one topic. But, uh, Lisa, final thoughts on the gubernatorial race? Uh, it's, to me, it's Lincoln Chafee that uh, he has to be... The X factor, you mean? Well, he has to be Governor Mundo's worst nightmare because if he does run... And he has the money to run, and we've already seen how critical he has been of her, and he'd be constant. He'd be a gift to the Republicans for what he would be able to do to really run hard against her and really criticize. And I think one of the reasons he wants to set the record straight, that she's criticized him on some of the things that he did as governor, and he wants to get out there and say, no, I, what I was doing was the right thing for the state. Could he help, though? Could he help Governor Raimondo in any way at forcing her and her staff to get uh, the positive message out about her earlier than maybe they wanted to? I mean, she has a ton of money, too. But in a, in a weird way, could it could it backfire? I still see it hurting her because she would have to spend more money in a primary than she would have to spend if she didn't have a primary opponent. So she could save all that money and just be on the airwaves from September to November. So she would have to spend that money to counter him in a primary race. Well, hey, I disagree yep. a little bit because I think she's going to start spending that money in July and August anyway. She has $3 million now, so probably a four million. Why is she going to spend that early? To keep building her image up. You bring in a, a campaign manager in who knows how to work with somebody who has low approval ratings, you start early. You start trying to change that image as early as you can. She has the money to do it. So whether she has a primary or not, I think she will spend the money uh, to try I, to change I, the image. Before we go to the break, I just think, too, it's easy for all of us to get uh, overly focused on campaign tactics right. and this and that. In the end, I think so much just depends on execution of her job as governor over the next six to 12 months, right? Do people, are there more explosions of bad news about UHIP, you know, or does she have more companies coming to Rhode Island? Does she have more good news to put forward? I really think, you know, it's not the only thing that matters, but I think a lot of it is just, you know, is the wind at your back or are you facing a headwind? And oh. I'm getting the last word. <laughs> It I is, guess it so. Is a, it is a lifetime away. It is a, it is a, it yeah, is a well, lifetime I guess we away. should point, point that out. We are. <laughs> Sorry, Tim. No, no, that's all right. We're a year away. When we come back, we have another big race to talk about, and that's U.S. Senate, and we're going to bring up the Me Too movement. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. This week, a political roundtable, a lot to talk about. We have Ted Nisi, Lisa Pelosi, 
Joe Fleming and Kara Cromwell. Let's talk about the U.S. Senate race. Former Justice Robert Flanders and State uh, Rep. Bobby Nardolillo will face off in a Republican primary, and the winner of that, of that will take on Democratic U.S. Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. Flanders made his announcement in Central Falls where he was uh, the receiver when they went into bankruptcy, and he is touting that as a success story, a turnaround story. But could the optics of Central Falls be used against him? I was curious that he chose Central Falls. And I think, you know, when his campaign folks probably thinking back, uh, the story of, of having the protesters there and the way the news reported it. So it was almost half and half. Yeah, sure, that the announcement. Your so you kind of lost your initial mm. positive announcement by having that and then the quotes from the people uh, there. So I think in retrospect, they probably thought mm, maybe this wasn't the best location for us. Was the best thing to happen to Sheldon Whitehouse uh, in terms of uh, from a campaign perspective, Joe, that Hillary Clinton lost? Uh, yes, it really was, because in 2006, he ran against uh, George Bush controlling the Senate. He might be able to do the exact same thing this year, running against Donald Trump controlling the Senate by keeping him in the U.S. Senate if the Democrats pick up a couple of seats. Um, it's a situation where he can run against it. He could take the Republican and tie the Republican to Donald Trump and really do that where I think it's a lot more difficult to do that in the governor's race. In the U.S. Senate race, you can. That whether it's uh, either one of these two Republicans would be basically serving Donald Trump, and you don't want that. Trump's numbers in Rhode Island are not that well at all. They're fairly low in the 30s. So I think this is going to be a big advantage for Sheldon Whitehouse. I think Flanders is going to have a challenge, too, of everybody is going to go to him with everything that Donald Trump ever says and say, do you agree, do you disagree? That's what his campaign... If Flanders makes it through the primary. I'm sorry. Yes, I apologize. If, if Flanders makes it through the primary. I think, well, even actually before, both of these guys are all every day going to have to answer this question, whether, you know, whatever Donald Trump said today, do you agree or disagree? Even more so it's, than for Governor Trump. And it's very it's hard to, to chart your own yeah. course that way and be on your own message, whereas, you know, Senator mm -hmm. Whitehouse can talk every day about his accomplishments, what he wants to do moving forward. And these guys are always, these guys are going to be in reactive mode. And I think too, and we, you know, uh, there's a reason we talked about the governor's race in the first half right off the top, and now we're getting to the Senate race. Because, you know, if you talk to Republicans privately, they will freely admit, you know, they do have high hopes, really high hopes of winning the governor's office next year. The Senate race is more of a reach. We've only had two Republicans win a Senate seat in Rhode Island since 1930. And they were both named Chafee. Lincoln Chafee won once, and his father, John Chafee, who Lisa actually worked for for a while. Um, and so it's, it's very hard for Republicans historically over the last century to win U.S. Senate races that are on federal issues uh, in Rhode Island. And so I think, um, I think that's a real challenge for them. And, you know, John Chafee had built up, it was a very different era. He won in 1976 his seat. And he had built up over multiple terms as governor, uh, as well as work in the state, uh, as a state representative before that. You know, he'd been around for a long time. Secretary of the Navy. Secretary of the Navy with, mm -hmm. for President Nixon. Mm -hmm. uh, as Joe was pointing out before, uh, Bar Bobby Nardolillo and Flanders are not known like John Chafee no. was in 1976. No, but keep in mind, uh, John Chafee benefited in 1976 because the Democrats had a real nasty primary. The governor, Phil Noel, ran in that primary, lost by 100 votes to a person <laughs> by the name of Richard Lauber, a car salesman, and the Senate Majority Leader John Hawkins was also in that primary. So it was a very nasty primary, and that, I think, benefited him in the general. Lisa, I have a uh, President Trump question for you. There's uh, always a lot of noise surrounding uh, the, the White House and a lot of uh, controversy, but when you cut through it, is there a lot for Republicans to be happy about. Uh, they've gotten a lot of judges on the bench in the federal appellate courts, uh, outpacing his predecessor so far. There's a tax pl uh, cut plan on the table. The stock market is up. Illegal border crossings are down. They're cutting regulations. A lot for Republicans to be happy about in the Trump administration? Let me say the people who voted for Trump who truly believed in what he wanted to do mm -hmm. as a candidate are very happy with him because since he became president, he's doing exactly what he said he would be doing as a candidate. So I think the, those those voters are very much in favor. When you talk about across the board Republicans like me, I'm not. <laughs> Why? <laughs> because. Uh, he is not representing the party. I never felt that he was a true representative of the Republican Party. He ran as a Republican, but not as a, a, um, as a true party uh, member. Uh, the number of 
ways that he's expressed himself throughout the camp um, throughout this year has been very troubling to me. The way, um, for example, with North Korea, how he how he's been dealing with that situation. I think he's been escalating when he doesn't have to do it. I wanted him to be more outreach for um, bipartisanship. When he did, he flirted with that a few months ago, working with the minority leaders Pelosi and Schumer. I thought finally we are going to get together and have some. Pipe, Why would he pipe? do that though? It's not how he won. But he wants to win, period. And if he wasn't winning by just working with the Republicans, he thought, let me go across the aisle and let me see if by working with the Democrats, some of the things that I want. So to what a congressional Republican candidate to do in the midterm election about Donald Trump? Do you embrace Donald Trump? Go all in on it? Do you, I suppose it depends, it depends on your on district, district. Yes. <laughs> of yeah. course. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Definitely. It depends on your district, and I think it depends on who you are and what you're thinking your future is. Yeah, I think, as you said before, I think it would be a very different case for Gina Raimondo and Sheldon Whitehouse if they were running uh, in a, under a Hillary Clinton presidency. Right. I think it's the climate is entirely... Heck, even a, a Jeb Bush presidency on the Republican side or a Marco Rubio presidency, I think the climate would be different. Uh, Donald Trump is just an X factor who has changed politics so much in so many ways that uh, you know he, he, he sucks the oxygen out of the room. I want to talk about the Me Too movement. Carol, we'll go to you first, actually, for both of our uh, professional women on the panel. Uh, the Me Too movement... All the news about sexual harassment, sexual assaults, it's rocked Hollywood, it's wa rocked Washington, and it's rocked the media. What's been your reaction to all of this? I guess um, I would say it's about time that we made this part of a conversation. Um, although I think the seeds of maybe the sexual predator stuff, um, which has come out more lately with uh, Moore in Alabama, was were sown during the uh, Clinton administration, where you know we kind of said it's okay if the president behaves that way with an intern. We did we let him off the hook, and I think it maybe trained a generation of um, men that it's okay to act like that. You can get away with it if you're powerful. Um, I'm encouraged to see it moving in a different direction. I think um, many of you may have read Senator Golden's article in Glamour. State Senator State Gail Senator, Golden, yeah. yeah. Um, and she made a really good point, right? Now it's all out there, but if you bring it up, you are then, you know, um, maybe segmented a little bit. Maybe you're not part of the conversation. So it's a little bit of a delicate balance. You know, you don't want women only want a shot, right? We only want it to be tra treated equally. We're not looking for anything more, um, and we certainly don't want to be stigmatized because you know somebody came on to us. Lisa, you know, I think we've been hearing um, week after week more people coming forward to, to say it. Uh, I'm waiting for even more to come forward because yeah. now that the crack has been cracked mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's opening up, when you look at the industries that have been so male-dominated, be it uh, government, uh, media, Hollywood, it's been so male-dominated industries that male have, men have risen to power, women want to be part of that industry and what they've accepted, I guess, along mm -hmm. the road to be mm -hmm. able to be part of it. But now, finally, it's great that we're, we, more people are coming forward and I think sit back, we're going to have even more names Names, more celebrity names coming forward. I'd just say, too, from talking to, you mentioned Senator Golden, um, talking to women at the State House here in Rhode Island, um, there's still uh, a lot of fear about coming forward about stories they might have to tell or stories maybe someone else has to tell because of the potential professional repercussions. You know, uh, a woman who's achieved enough to be a state lawmaker doesn't necessarily want to now be, I, look at uh, uh, Representative Tansy, who was on with us a few weeks back. Yes. She's probably never gotten more statewide attention than when she talked about uh, her sexual harassment experience at the State House. But she didn't run to be a, a sexual harassment uh, survivor poster child. She ran because she cares about issues like guns and, and other things like that. And so I think it's, it's it, I've talked to women who I think are clearly having a tough time deciding, do I want to, they see the power of telling those stories, mm -hmm. but they also, they say, D there are things you might give up or, or risks you might take, as I think Kara spoke to. It's, it's uh, it's, it's, it's been very interesting to watch how all this plays out, and, and I think eye-opening for a lot of men. And I think for, not to give you some advice as men, but <laughs> a, a little piece of it is kind of not being a bystander, mm. right? You know, right. you might know somebody who's a little bit of a lech, you know, kind of don't, don't put up with it mm. um, if you see it. Mm -hmm. So, see something, say something. <laughs> we have two minutes left in the show. I quickly want to shift gears majorly uh, back to local politics. Um, Ted, uh, we have a lieutenant governor's race. Mm. Progressive Democratic candidate and state rep Aaron Regenberg is taking on Democratic incumbent Lieutenant Governor 
Dan McKee. This could be one of the sleeper races to me. This one could be interesting. CNN, to my surprise, put this on its list of nine Did primaries to watch oh, nationwide wow. next year because it's seen as very much a proxy right. fight between minor, more old school moderate Democrats and more uh, progressive Democrats, kind of the Bernie Sanders energy. Uh, Aaron Regenberg's putting a lot of effort into this. He's he's got he had a lot of enthusiasm at his kickoff. I think Dan McKee thinks you know he's kind of a traditional Democrat in Rhode Island. I'm I'm curious how uh, I know Joe is too. We were talking about it about how this plays out. Yeah, I think one of the big things in this whole primary is going to be the Democratic primary turnout. If there's no primary for governor, and this is the main race in the ballot, mm -hmm. it could be a very small turnout. If it is, that's going to help Aaron greatly because he has a lot of progressive support and a lot of union support. Remember, McKee was a big charter school person, right. so a lot of the teachers' unions will not support him at all. Where if the turnout gets large, that could benefit Dan McKee, getting the, the communities of Northern Rhode Island coming out supporting him. So, I mean, the turnout's going to be a big issue here. I think McKee's going to try to make a a point of Aaron's age and inexperience about working. And he's going to talk about his credentials as a businessman, as a mayor, as a lieutenant governor. Mm -hmm. He's going to see, as, he's, as his allies are already saying, can you imagine Aaron Reagan, let's say someone wins in 2020 and uh, a Democrat and Gina Raimondo is taken to Washington. Can you imagine Aaron Regenberg as your governor that day? That's going to be a big push from the McKee campaign. Joe Fleming, Lisa Pelosi, Ted Nisi, Cara Cromwell, thank you all so much. And we're taping on a Wednesday. Happy Thanksgiving to all of you. <laughs> happy Thanksgiving. Most of you are watching on a Sunday. I hope you had a happy and healthy Thanksgiving. Ted and I, of course, will be back next week. Don't forget, Eyewitness News is your local election headquarters. I think we'll be doing a lot of debates this that year. Looks like. <laughs> so stick with us here on Eyewitness News. For all of us, we'll see you next week on Newsmaker.